Good morning all and thank you for joining us on today's webinar. I do hope you're all keeping safe and well. First of all, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are all still working remotely, so as usual, we do apologise in advance for any unplanned disturbances. I am actually back in the office again today to avoid the builders at home and it's nice to be back. Just so that you know, you are all on mute and your cameras are switched off, so you can see us but we can't see you. There is the facility to ask questions as we go through today's presentation, so please do so. Um, and you can do this by typing your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We will try and answer all the questions on the webinar if time allows, allows but if not, don't worry, we will follow up afterwards and we will get back to you. We've topics so far on these sessions and the feedback has been excellent. All our previous webinars are now on our new YouTube channel, so please do take a look on there and you can find us by searching for Oakmere Wealth. You may remember a few weeks ago, we sent out an email with a link to a survey asking what you, our clients, would like to see covered on the webinars. The overwhelming response was that you wanted to know more about wills and inheritance tax planning. We did cover wills in a webinar that we did at the end of June, which is now on the YouTube channel. And today's session is going to follow on from that to cover inheritance tax. Planning what happens to your wealth when you're no longer here to enjoy it is something we only tend to do once. It may seem like a mountainous task or maybe even a little taboo, and it's obviously not the happiest subject. However, it is vital to have a plan in place to secure your financial peace of mind. Legacy planning helps to prepare for any unforeseen events. It might be through a creation of a in case of emergency pack, which a family could turn to if the worst was to happen. This way, your loved ones can have access to everything they may need so that your wishes can be carried out in the proper manner. And in case of emergency pack might include things like your will, insurances, passwords, bank accounts and vital contact details. Proper legacy planning enables your beneficiaries to maintain to obtain maximum value from any assets or wealth that is passed on. <clears throat> By planning appropriately, it allows you to ascertain the true value of your estate and to minimise the impact of any taxes on it. Stopping arguments before they start is another reason why legacy planning is essential. It allows you to choose who controls your finances and assets should you be able to do so. It also allows you to plan to make plans that are personal to any beneficiaries of the estate. For example, you might want to make arrangements for a child with health problems or set up for a trust for one who might not be better, might be better not inheriting a large lump sum. <clears throat> it's all about getting your wishes across accurately and delivering your wealth in the way that you see fit. The bottom line is that estate planning eliminates uncertainty. It makes sure that your beneficiaries are taken care of in the manner you see fit, and it's vital to be prepared for the future. Having a plan in place will give you peace of mind so that you can get on with enjoying your life. Now we know from experience that financial goals will certainly change as we move through various stages of our lives. But the one constant is that good planning is the key to, successful, to a successful wealth management strategy and will almost certainly deliver positive outcomes. So today we'd like to welcome back Michelle Tong from JMW Solicitors. Michelle is a trainee solicitor in the private client department at JMW, which is one of the leading private client practices in the Northwest. She's been at the firm since 2017 and will qualify into the department in September. Michelle assists individuals and their families in all aspects of client, private client law. She advises on wills, trusts, inheritance, tax, probate, estate and succession planning and power of attorney documents. Michelle's clients are from all walks of life and range from private individuals, including those with a high net worth, through to business owners. So welcome, Michelle. Unmute you. Morning, everybody. As Carla said, I'm a trainee solicitor at JMW Solicitors in Manchester. So JMW is a full service law firm, but there's around 12 of us, including myself, who just specialise in wills, probate, trust and estate planning. Our team specifically specialises in advising high net worth individuals and therefore naturally one of the key focus areas that we cover is inheritance tax. When we're discussing inheritance tax planning with our clients, we often refer to the tax as a voluntary tax. Now, this isn't because your beneficiaries can decide whether or not they want to pay it on your death. 
as it is unfortunately compulsory tax payable to HMRC. But it is something that can be avoided with the right planning and with the right professional advice. Inheritance tax planning can be particularly successful where an individual receives inheritance tax planning advice from both their private client solicitor and the financial advisor. And this is something I will cover in a more detail a bit later in the webinar. So what is inheritance tax? Inheritance tax is a tax on the transfer of, of assets on death. There is about 5.3 billion expected to be raised in inheritance tax in the last tax year, which is obviously a significant sum. Inheritance tax is payable at a rate of 40% on assets above the nil rate band. And the nil rate band currently stands at 325,000 pounds. The rate of 40% is reduced to a rate of 36%, so not reduced by much if the 10% of an estate passes to charity. Therefore, there can be a significant amount of tax payable on somebody's death if there's no inheritance tax planning undertaken during an individual's lifetime. So what reliefs are available from this significant tax? As mentioned on the previous slide, every individual in England and Wales has what's called a nil rate band available to them of £325,000. From October 2017, this nil rate band is transferable between spouses. This means that if the first spouse to buy to die does not use his or her nil rate band allowance, this nil rate band can then be claimed by the second spouse to die, provided that the entire estate passes between the spouses on the first death. Ultimately, this means that for married couples or couples in a civil, couples in a civil partnership, there can be a potential nil rate band relief available to them of £650,000. And that is able to pass to the next generation free of inheritance tax. It does not matter when the first spouse died and only when the second spouse died. So for example, if a husband died in the year 2000, he didn't fill in an inheritance tax form, but then his wife later died in 2020, they would be able to claim that total of 650,000 pounds on their death. It's possible to claim multiple transferable nil rate bands. For example, if you were widowed and remarried and then that spouse was to pass away, but only up to a maximum of one extra nil rate band. Another relief that is available from inheritance tax is the residence nil rate band, which is something that you might have heard of before. So this is an additional inheritance tax allowance that applies where an individual dies on or after the 6th of April 2017. The residence nil rate band is currently worth £175,000 per person, although this will increase in line with inflation during the next tax year. So who can claim the residence nil rate band? An estate will be able to benefit from the residence nil rate band if the individual dies on or after the 6th of April 2017, the individual owns a home or a share of a home so that is included in their estate. The property can be a whole property that is owned or it can be a share of a property, for example if the deceased owned 25% of a house. The individual must have lived in the property as their main residence at some stage, although there's no minimum period of residence. And, and the, big, the big one for a residence nil rate band is that the individual's direct descendants must inherit the home. And this means that the residence nil rate band doesn't apply to everybody. So direct descendants are children, stepchildren, adopted children, foster children, grandchildren, or other lineal descendants. Surprisingly, the spouse or civil partner of a lineal descendant can also be considered a direct descendant, but what, who aren't included are brothers, sisters, other members of the family, such as aunts and uncles. Importantly, the value of the residence nil rate band begins to decrease if an estate is worth more than £2 million. This, the relief is lost on a sliding scale of £1 for every £2 that is the value of the estate that exceeds £2 million. So essentially, this means that after 2.35 million, the relief is lost completely. The residence nil rate band is also transferable between spouses, like the nil rate band. So again, if it is not used on the death of the first spouse, it can be utilised on the death of the second spouse. This gives a total relief of £350,000 for married couples. When you add this figure of £350,000 to the previous nil rate band figure of £650,000, this is where you get this £1 million figure that you might have heard the government talk about a few years ago. However, it's important to note that not everybody can benefit from this full £1 million allowance, particularly if you don't have children or you're not married, for example. 
further, even when if you are a married couple and you have children or you have direct descendants, it doesn't necessarily mean you can claim the residence nil rate band. And this is because when people have wills in place, often they were put in place before 2017. And the terms of the will itself actually negates the availability of the residence nil rate band. For example, somebody might have given a percentage of the property to a partner instead of to a child. So it's just important to double check your wills, particularly if they were made before 2017 just to check that you're able to claim all of the inheritance tax reliefs available to you if you were to pass away. Another relief from inheritance tax is the business property relief. This is also known as BPR. So BPR is available if a business is wholly or mainly trading. This is an important point because this means that rental properties such as investment property or buy-to-let properties, don't essentially qualify for the allowance. In order to qualify for BPR, the owner must also have owned the business for a continuous two-year period before death, and there must not be a binding contract for sale in place. If you ensure whether you're able to benefit from BPR, it's important to take professional advice. And even if you do not own a business, there is also the potential to invest in BPR investments. And this is something that I think Carla will talk to you about in more detail later in the webinar. If you are able to benefit from BPR, however, there is a potential of saving up to 100% of inheritance tax on business assets. In addition to the inheritance tax release that are available, there are also some exemptions from inheritance tax that can be taken advantage of during a person's lifetime. For an example, an individual is able to gift up to £3,000 per year, and this is per person. So both a husband and wife would give a total of £3,000 per year to individuals of their choosing. In addition to this £3,000, an individual is able to gift up to £250 per year to anyone they like, although please know that this can't be the same person that the £3,000 has been given to. An individual is also able to gift normal expenditure out of surplus income. And this is quite a common exemption that we advise our clients to consider. So for example, if you have an excess income of £150,000 per year that isn't needed to fund your day-to-day -day living, the ex excess income can actually be used to fund life policy premiums, make regular pension contributions, or indeed make regular gifts into trust for the benefit of children or grandchildren. Another exemption is that if you know somebody that's getting married, you can give a wedding gift before a wedding. This wedding gift can be up to £5,000 for a child, £2,500 for a grandchild, and £1,000 to a friend or other relative. There is also no inheritance tax on gifts to spouses, as there's no, gift, um, no inheritance tax between gifts to husbands and wife, and there's no inheritance tax on gifts to charities or political parties. A gift may also be exempt from inheritance tax if it is made seven years before the date of death. This is what is known as a potentially exempt transfer. A potentially exempt transfer will pass free of inheritance tax, provided that you survive seven years after making the gift. If you die within seven years of making the gift and it is not exempt, the rate of tax on the gift is 20%, increasing up to the normal rate of 40%, depending on when the gift was made. So, for example, if you were to gift £200,000 to a child and then you were to die six months later, the full rate of 40% would be payable. Please note that you are unable to gift items and retain a benefit from them. And this is quite an important point and I think it's something sometimes clients aren't aware of. So, for example, if you wanted to gift a rental property to your child and transfer it into their name, you would not be able to receive rental income from that property because from HMRC will consider that as a gift with a rate reservation of benefit and still tax it from an inheritance tax point of view. Also, when clients are considering gifting, we always advise them to consider or carefully consider against outright gifting. And this is because once an outright gift is made, so for, for example, if a gift of £200,000 is made or a gift of a property, the client has at that point lost complete control over that asset. Also, once a gift is made, that gift then forms part of the child's estate and if they were to go through a divorce or bankruptcy proceedings the asset is potentially vulnerable. So ultimately if you are considering get lifetime gifting it's important to seek that professional advice. An integral part of inheritance tax planning 
is ensuring that your pensions and life insurance policies are up to date and that you have sought advice on these. Pensions normally fall outside of your estate for inheritance tax purposes, so it is important that it is something that is considered and potentially maximised. Life insurance policies can also fall outside of your estate, provided that they are written into trust. Again, it's important to seek advice in this regard. One thing to consider is what if your children are wealthy in their own right? Or what if they have an inheritance tax problem of their own? Would it be better at that point for your grandchildren to inherit some of the funds from the policy? Normally, as long as grandchildren are named as 1% beneficiaries, money can be sent to them. So now that I have discussed some of the reliefs and exemptions from inheritance tax, I thought it'd be useful to put it into context and give you an idea of our typical client and how we might assist them and provide them with some advice when it comes to their inheritance tax planning. So a typical client for us is a husband and wife with grandchildren and children. Sometimes there's stepchildren in the family or there's blended families. That client normally owns a family home, which is their main residence which qualifies for the residence nil rate ban relief. That home is normally 350,000 to 3 million. The property is usually mortgage free, but not always. The client normally owns a business which qualifies for business property relief because it's a trade in business that they've owned for a period of two years. The value of this can range from anywhere between 1 million to 500 million. The part of the estate, however, does not qualify for inheritance tax relief, and this is normally quite a large portion. It can be 1 million up to 20 million. And the assets that don't qualify for any relief from inheritance tax are things like property portfolios, cash in banks, ISAs, or investments held with financial advisors, for example. The client normally has pensions, death in service benefits, and life policies to consider. So how do we advise that client and assist them with their inheritance tax aims and objectives? First of all, I think it's important for me to highlight that there is not a one size fits all when it comes to inheritance tax planning. It's important that we review each individual family situation and consider each member of the family and what they want to achieve. What is important to the grandparents, the children and the grandchildren? What are their overall aims and objectives? Is it to completely mitigate inheritance tax? Do the grandparents want to retain control of the assets or are they in a position where they can give away some of their investments that do not qualify for any of the inheritance tax reliefs? Do they need any income from those in investments? What are the children's tax matrimonial and, matrimonial and financial positions? For example, if the children are in stable relationships but the grandchildren are still sorry, the grandparents are still concerned about a child's divorce in the future, would it be more appropriate to gift assets into a trust rather than gifting outright? what tax consequences are there of gifting into trust. Therefore, the point I want to make is that when it comes to inheritance tax planning, it's crucial that each family is considered as a whole. And this is where we see the best results when we team up with a client's financial advisor, a client's accountants and other tax advisors. This enables, enables us to consider all of a family's assets, the family's aims and objectives, and all of the different options that are available to them in relation to their inheritance tax planning. And where we do join up with a financial advisor, we really do see excellent results and can often completely mitigate a, a client's inheritance tax liability. When we're assisting clients with inheritance tax planning, one of the most important things we consider are the client's wills themselves and ensuring that the wills are tax efficient and up to date. Tax planning can actually be done within the wills themselves and wills can be a, a particularly useful tax planning tool where the clients own a number of investment properties. The issue with clients that own properties from an inheritance tax point of view is that they can often not gift the properties during their lifetime without paying significant capital gains tax, as usually the properties have made a significant gain since the date of purchase. There is no capital gains tax between husband and wife, but for gifting to anybody else, such as children or grandchildren, capital gains tax may be triggered. In order to assist clients with this issue, we advise that they put in place wills incorporating what is known as flexible life interest trusts. With these wills, on the death of the first spouse, all assets owned by the deceased will pass into the trust, of which the surviving spouse is the primary beneficiary and has a right to income for the rest of their life. There is no inheritance tax payable on the first death, as there is no inheritance tax payable between husband and wife. There's also no capital gains tax payable on the assets passing into the trust. 
Therefore, the trustees of the trust can give some of the assets out of the trust if they wish. And provided that the surviving spouse survives seven years, there's no inheritance tax payable on the half of the estate that's passed into the trust, nor is there any capital gains tax. Now, I appreciate this is a little bit of a complex structure, and um, so I think I'll just give an example of how this could potentially work in practice. So an example how it could work in practice is an estate where we have a husband and wife, they have children, but they've done no tax planning within their lifetime and they just have basic will structures in place. The husband and wife have a £3 million property portfolio. Sadly, they lose the residence nil rate band, which is the inheritance tax relief on the main residence, as their estate is over that £2 million mark, which we talked about before. So their entire estate is taxed at the £3 million value, less their nil rate band that is available to them both of £650,000, but then the rest of the estate is still taxed at 40%. And this leaves them with a massive inheritance tax liability of £940,000. However, if those clients come to us and do some tax planning, they put in place flexible life interest trust wills, that £3 million estate with that property portfolio then passes on the first death, half of it into the trust. If the surviving spouse then passes, survives seven years, the estate is only taxed at £200,000 instead of £940,000. And this is because half of the estate, being £1.5 million, has already passed into that trust structure. So then the clients only have £1.5 million left, less their nil rate bands of £650,000, less their residence nil rate bands of £350,000, which they can now claim because the estate is under £2 million, and the rest is taxed at 40%. So just by putting wills in place, the clients have saved £740,000. Even if the surviving spouse doesn't survive seven years, which is often the concern, what is called taper relief may still apply after three years. And that is a reduced rate of inheritance tax after three years. So they would still be saving a significant amount of money. The clients may also wish to consider putting life insurance in place to protect themselves against the risk of dying within seven years. And I think life insurance is something that Carla will cover later in the webinar. So what are the key considerations from a private client perspective? And these are things that I like to call quick wins. I appreciate inheritance tax planning can be quite in depth and it can be quite lengthy, but just by doing these simple things, you can significantly reduce your inheritance tax liability. So one of the things is that I want you to take away from today is it's extremely important to engage in inheritance tax planning during your lifetime. If you consider inheritance tax planning, you should seek advice from both your solicitor and your financial advisor as offering this joint up approach achieves excellent results. You should consider wills incorporating trusts and just make sure that you have wills that are up to date so that your wills are able to benefit from all of the available inheritance tax relief, such as that nil rate band and the residence nil rate band. At JMW, we offer a free will review service, free of charge on a no obligation basis. And we also, in, in that work free will review, just cover the client's inheritance tax position. So we'd be more than happy to look at any wills that you already have in place. Finally, review your pensions and your life insurance policies and ensure that they are correctly nominated and written into trust. Just by doing this simple thing can save the family thousands of pounds. So thank you for listening and I hope you find my part of the webinar quite useful. I'll now leave you with Carla to talk to you about how she is able to assist her clients with inheritance tax planning. Shut up if the sound goes funny again. I do apologise. Right, so where was I? So in the mid 80s, Roy Jenkins described IHT as a voluntary levy paid by those that distrust their heirs more than they dislike the inland revenue. I believe the reason that he said this is that there are many, many, many legitimate ways to manage and or reduce your exposure to this tax. All you need to do is indulge in a little forward planning. It's vitally important that you do discuss your plans with an experienced solicitor or a financial planner because the messages that you pick up from friends and relatives and even the press can be very confusing and ultimately misleading. We've already heard from Michelle today about the nil rate band and the residence nil rate band. It is important to seek advice, as particularly the primary residence qualification rules can get very complicated. 
So Michelle's already covered uh, some of this detail, uh, but we've just summarised it onto quite a, a basic chart, which we can send out to you if, if you want a copy of this. But the first thing to consider with inheritance tax planning is making use of any exemptions that are available to you. So we've got the small gift exemption, uh, which means that you can give £250 to as many individuals or trusts as you like within a tax year. As Michelle already said, it can't be combined with any other exempt gifts like the annual gift allowance, but it's a really valuable small gift that you can give to people. The annual gift allowance of £3,000 is a personal exemption, and it's often confused as a gift for kids allowance. It's not £3,000 per child, it's important to remember, but you could break it up and gift £1,000 to three separate children and thereby benefit from the allowance. You can also make gifts on weddings, so up to £5,000 is a gift in consideration of marriage, and grandparents can give £2,500 and others up to £1,000. The benefit here is that the amount immediately reduces your estate value. You don't need to worry about the seven-year clock. Now, one of the most underused exemptions, as Michelle mentioned earlier, is the gift from income or gift out of normal expenditure. This is a really powerful exemption because it has no capital limit, but it is important to understand how the rules of this exemption can be used. Gifted money must be from income, so it can't be cash savings. So the types of income, it could be interest on your savings, it could be income from investments, uh, excluding tax deferred income on bonds, it could be rental income, it could be salary, or it could be a pension. The second point to remember here is that the gifted income must be surplus to requirements. So a simple method is to consider your total income for the year and your typical outgoings, and then the difference between those two is your surplus. So if this figure is low or negative, that means really you're living off capital, so the exemption is probably not for you. But if you do have a surplus there, then it's perhaps a, a gift that we can make use of. The third important point to be aware of is that the gifted income must be regular. So it's reg this is relatively, relatively simple, but it's worth being aware, aware of. And regular could mean a number of things. Generally, we say that it should be habitual and it should be for at least three years, but the HMRC do have their own interpretation of things. I do suggest that if you are looking to use any of these exemptions, you, that you do seek advice on the best way to document it to make sure that it is effective. And finally, you can leave money to a registered charity during your lifetime or on death, and the transfer will be totally exempt from IHT. Political parties also qualify for this exemption, but I'm not aware of many clients who are desperate to leave all their money to Boris at the moment, but you never know. So making large or regular gifts to your loved ones can be rewarding and powerful in terms of managing your exposure to inheritance tax. However, it does mean losing access and control over how much money is spent. Trusts are a really powerful tool, enabling those who are gifting to retain control over how the money is spent or used. And even in some circumstances, you can retain access to capital or income for yourselves. Advice on the type of trust structure, the appointed trustees and the beneficiaries will vary depending upon your aims. And it's really important to discuss as part of a broader financial plan. So I just want to cover now some of the areas where we can assist in it with, with trust planning. So a common scenario that we see is where clients have considerable funds which will be subject to inheritance tax, but they're actually using that money to generate income. So don't feel they can give it away. One option that we have is something called the discounted gift plan. And this was designed to enable clients to give away access to the capital while still retaining a right to income. So the way that this works is by making a gift into trust. Trustees are subject to high rates of tax and tax compliance on an annual basis. So the gift would be invested into an investment bond. And this is a really tax efficient manner of investing. What this means is that on death, any residue that's left in the investment is available to the beneficiaries. But throughout the lifetime of the person making the gift, they can take an income from that investment. So in addition to the trustees, uh, you, in a, you select a fixed level of income, which is going to be payable until your death. The income basically discounts the value of the gift that you've made into trust. And that's done by assessing at outset your health and longevity. 
So in simple terms, what we do is we carve out the amount you'll need to pay yourself for the rest of your natural life. Because that chunk of money is now seen to be a stream of income payments, it immediately drops out of any inheritance tax calculation if you were to die in the short term. Now, the things we have to be aware of with a discounted gift plan is that you're not selecting to take too much income at outset, because if you're taking that income back out of the trust and bring it back into your estate, your estate is just going to carry on rising. So it's really important that we only set up this type of plan where there is, there is a genuine need for income. Another option that we see, or another um, solution we have, is something called a beneficiary income plan. And this is where people want to gift a regular income. So it can be used in conjunction with the regular gifts from income exemption, um, and it can be used to build up a lump sum. So this is useful if you want to gift an immediate or deferred income to loved ones to provide, for example, for your children or grandchildren with the security of ongoing regular financial assistance. So an income is set up for your beneficiaries to receive a fixed amount on a specific date. The payment can be saved towards a specific longer term goal, such as contributing to, towards university fees or a future house, and it can be for children or for grandchildren. The payment can only be saved by the recipient, but not by the trust. The money is placed in a discretionary trust, so the family can potentially benefit from a reduction in inheritance tax. Another case that we see, another scenario, is that you might want to gift money, but actually you're worried about what your needs could be later in life. So we have a later life planning trust, and it might be suitable for you if you're looking to make a gift now, but are concerned that you may need money in the future to help with unforeseen costs such as care costs. The later life scheme allows you to make a gift of capital now in order to reduce the value of your estate for inheritance tax purposes, whilst at the same time providing you with a predetermined income to help meet expenses of care in later life, but only if you need it. A loan plan, which is another option, allows you to achieve inheritance tax savings over time, whilst allowing for continued access to your original capital. So what this means is that any investment growth on the gift is outside of your estate from day one. The loan can be repaid in regular instalments to you, to provide you with income on a regular or an ad hoc basis when you require it. And basically what you'll be doing here is you're drawing down uh, the, the loan that you've given into the trust. So this could be suitable to you if you're unable or unwilling to make an outright gift as you're concerned that you may require access to it in the future, uh, either on a regular or an ad hoc basis. It could also be suitable if you've got a lump sum available now that you're looking to invest and you're willing to forego any future growth on the amount invested. Quite often we see with people, it's the growth on the estate that can push them into uh, an inheritance tax situation. It's also suitable if you're willing to make a decision now on who should benefit from any future growth on the amount invested, and you're able to accept that you won't be able to change that decision at a later date. And that's only the situation with an absolute trust. With a discretionary trust, you do still have flexibility over beneficiaries. So this is something that Michelle touched on earlier in the webinar, but certainly another area that we can help. So business relief, formerly known as business property relief, offers an exemption to inheritance tax after two years. So it's typically available on enterprise investment schemes investments, but your own business may also qualify, as may other investments that you may hold directly. So you could hold aim listed shares, agricultural land or property. It's really important to seek advice to ensure that any qualifying assets are identified and considered as part of a broad trust and estate planning strategy, where we're looking to achieve a tax efficient transition of your wealth to the next generation. This slide is just a reminder of how business relief uh, can help to fit into later life estate planning as an alternative to gifting. One of the issues we often have is that people will leave inheritance tax planning until quite late on until the fairly elderly and the worry then is are they going to live the seven years needed for gifts normal gifts to drop out of their estate as business relief only needs a two-year window it's a, a very successful alternative for people who are much older and this chart uh, taken of the office from the office of national statistics just uh, illustrates a comparison of the chances of living the required number of years to meet iht planning requirements 
and it uses the options that are subject to the seven year rule, so gifts, uh, as opposed to using the two year IHT rule, so investing in assets which qualify for business property relief. So clearly it's not all about gifting money away. This is a key decision as to how much control or access you need when it comes to wealth planning. How much access do you need to your wealth or your assets during your lifetime? Some people may need complete control and access to all assets until death. And if this is a strong preeminent need, then no sharing of wealth will in practice be possible. And we have to consider other pots, such as using life insurance to create a pot of money to pay the inheritance tax when it falls due. And this can be done through a whole of life insurance policy. In most of the circumstances that we come across, clients will not necessarily want that much control or access. And so a whole lifetime of financial planning possibilities are open to you and your family. As Michelle previously mentioned, the important part is taking advice and starting to create a strategy. And the best outcomes happen when we work together with other professionals, such as solicitors and accountants, alongside you as our clients. So that's all from me. Um, we'll just go on to see if we've got any questions. Let me just bring... Um, the Q&A box here. Okay, so um, Michelle, if I can just bring you back in, you may want to comment on this one. So if I can just ask a question we've had here, Michelle, when is the best time for someone to start planning, would you say? I'd say if you're asking the question, probably now, and um, there's no <laughs> harm in at least taking the advice. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do anything now. And it might be after a meeting, when we sit down with yourself and Carla, we might say, actually, I don't feel like you need to do anything at the minute. You've not got too much of inheritance tax liability. Let's reconsider it in five years. And we always recommend to clients that review the wills and inheritance tax planning every five years anyway. But I, I don't think there is too early of a time to do inheritance tax planning because the strategy can take you know seven years in order to be effective and i think death happens at an arbitrary moment in time even though you're fit and healthy you don't know what's going to happen in the future and, and we see some really sad circumstances in practice yeah brilliant um and I, I would agree with that i mean certainly the sooner you start for, from our perspective the better i mean obviously you've got the seven year rule which starts ticking the sooner we can get that underway it may be a case that we don't actually just do it once we could make a gift that seven years could drop out and then we look to do something else seven years later. So it's very much an ongoing process yeah. and also making sure it's regularly reviewed. Yeah, I agree. And it's not just a case as well of just re reviewing your circumstances. If, if you do have children or grandchildren, it's, it's useful to look at the family as a whole because mm -hmm. you might be gifting a lot to your children, but they might be wealthy in their own right. So yeah. is it more appropriate for us to start gifting into trust at this point rather than gifting outright to children? Yeah. And quite often, I'm sure you'll agree, Michelle, it's a combination of, of a number of different things, which makes the, the ultimate strategy. I agree. Yeah, definitely. OK. Uh, another question come through here. Um, do we need to keep a record of gifts that we make? And also, just to add on to that, uh, Michelle, how, um, how is the best way for people to record those gifts? Yep, of course. So I would say, yes, definitely keep a record of all gifts that you make. So what happens in practice if you were to pass away is that you have to fill in what's called an inheritance tax form. And if you have an inheritance tax liability, it's quite a lengthy form. And HMRC wants to know a lot of detail about the gifts that you've made. So they will ask the questions, what gifts have been made in the last seven years? So any gift you make, I would just keep either a note of it with your private client solicitor, if you have one, or your financial advisor. Or if not, just keep a spreadsheet and the, so that the family knows where it is. I know um, it's quite a depressing thing to say, but my mum and dad have a what's called a death box. And it's actually a black box <laughs> where they keep the wills or a list of all of their assets. So that if they were to pass away, it's easy for the family just to know where everything's kept. And also a record of any gifts that they've made so just, just important to keep all of those things together. Brilliant, thank you. And just another one, this, this one uh, for you again, Michelle. Um, can a will be changed after death to avoid inheritance tax? So yes, in a way it can. So there is something called a deed of variation. And what that does is it can be changed within two years of the date of death to avoid inheritance tax. 
Now, what we see in practice is when I was talking about the residence nil rate band before, a lot of people's wills actually negate the availability of the residence nil rate band. And one of the reasons this might happen is because trusts are included in the wills. So the main residence might be gifted onto a trust. So what we often do is do a deed of variation to change the, who inherits the estate so that the main residence is gifted to the children. And that can avoid as much inheritance tax being payable on the estate. The only thing with the deed of variation is that it, do, it does have to be agreed by the executors and the beneficiaries. So we can see problems in practice whereby some people don't agree. Yeah. Okay. And just one last question, uh, please, Michelle. Uh, on the nil rate band, does it matter if assets are not shared in not not shared in ownership? For example, one person has a property, the other has a shares ISA. Does the six hundred and fifty apply regardless to the remaining partner? So, so what was that? Sorry, Carl. It depended on so, what assets they have. Yeah. So with the with um, you've got a couple, and the yep. assets aren't necessarily shared in ownership. So one person yep. may own the property, one may own an ISA. Yeah. Does the six hundred and fifty apply regardless? Yep, so it's transferable between spouses. So as provided that the wills are structured correctly, that everything's passing between them on the first death, it doesn't matter who owns what of the, of the property or the Brilliant. investment. Okay, I think we've covered all the questions there. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. You're um, so thank you, everybody. I, I, hope, uh, I hope you found that interesting. Apologies for the uh, technical issues early on. Um, so do keep an eye out for the email about our next webinar we're going to take a break in august but we will be back in september um just to remind you that here at oakmere it is now business as usual whilst we won't be doing webinars in august we are still working we're not all uh, we're not all on holiday unfortunately um, we are able to carry out all meetings by video or phone and most paperwork can now be completed electronically so do just get in touch with us we're all here we'd all love to have a chat with you at any time we are in the process of rolling out a new client online portal, which is fantastic. Um, it encompasses video meetings, secure messaging, uh, electronic signing of forms. So we will be contacting you individually about this very soon if we haven't done so already. Um, finally, I just want to say thank you, Michelle, for giving us your time again today. Um, really welcome. appreciate that. I know you're very busy. And thank you to you all for attending and sticking with us through the technical issues earlier on today. Thank you very much. Goodbye.